commencement speaker, Mike O'Malley. All right! Woo! Yeah! Well, thank you. Today, all across this country, Nobel laureates and Pulitzer Prize winners are addressing graduates like you. UNH brings you the guy from Guts. Your lives will only improve from this moment. You know, my trusty referee Mo was going to be here with me, but... Unfortunately, she's giving the commencement speech at Oxford today. To answer the most popular question I've had during the week from graduates all across the campus, no, Mo and I never hooked up. For those of you who don't get any of these jokes, or who haven't heard, Guts was a sports show I hosted on Nickelodeon during the previous millennium. I am not ashamed of this. When you stand in the shadow of a presence as powerful as the aggro crag, you shall never deny your allegiance to it. I am honored and grateful that the commencement committee chose me to be here with you. After the news sank in, I, I called President Hart and I asked her why she thought that instead of the usual pomp or prestige that a poet or an astronaut might bring to this event, why she thought that I topped the list. And she said to me, you know, Mike, we live in a time where hope often seems to be in short supply. Our committee concluded that if a guy with a 2.89 GPA could make his dreams come true, Anybody can. <laughs> Class of 2006, I don't care what your GPA is, graduating is an incredible achievement. Congratulations. You know, I want to begin by addressing those of you who actually were expecting a poet or an astronaut. Or maybe you were hoping that you'd get as a speaker someone whose yearnings you felt ran more in step with your own. I can tell you that 18 years ago, my yearnings were not that different from yours. 18 years ago, I sat at this ceremony trying to conjure up a viable future for myself. 18 years ago, I wanted to make a contribution to the goodness of the world rather than subtract from it. 18 years ago, I wanted to find work that gave my life meaning and someone to share it with and share my triumphs and struggles. 18 years ago, I wanted to stay close with the friends who had filled my college years with depth and vitality, because you know what? 18 years ago, I was swamped with the sadness that comes from the realization that once I left Durham, I would no longer be a five-minute walk from 20 of my closest friends. I love my time at UNH. UNH is where I land to stand on my own two feet. And there's nowhere I feel more comfortable than standing here before you today. I was one of you. You know, people ask me why I became an actor, and the truth is that once you get cut, uh, once you get cut from the high school baseball team, you need another angle to get women to pay attention. What better way than getting cast in a play where they've actually paid admission to watch you speak funny dialogue on an elevated, brightly lit platform. What better way, you say? I know, be good looking and rich, but I had neither one of those weapons in my arsenal. If I became an actor to meet women, it is not why I chose it as a major. I chose it as a major because at UNH I found a theater department that encouraged people with professors like Gaynar Doan, Carol Luca Burns, Gil Davenport, and John Edwards, who forced me to try different things. I augmented that with classes in writing with professors Tom Newkirk and Bruce Ballinger, who taught me to learn how to express myself and that writing is its own worthwhile pursuit. I owe these people so much. They are the reason I am here. I honor them today. 
There are others at UNH I have to thank. One professor in the sociology department taught me that I should not have a career in math. He taught me that I shouldn't leave a gen ed requirement social stats class for Tuesdays at 8 a.m. in a senior year where my primary focus was staying out late and sleeping in. His name escapes me, but um, I want to thank him for bringing my 3.0 down to a 2.89, really, seriously. Thank you. Seriously, thanks. I hope you got tenure. All right. With the, with the encouragement of my parents and the professors I had here at UNH, I decided it would be an actor's life for me. So 18 years ago, I moved to New York City. Before leaving for my graduation present, my grandmother gave me a St. Jude necklace. Now, for those of you who don't know, St. Jude is a Catholic saint whose particular area of intercessional expertise is in the very general category called lost causes. Now, when you're moving to New York to pursue a one in a million shot, the most inspiring way to leave New Hampshire is not wearing a medal that says it probably is a lost cause. But my grandmother knew that despite my good intentions, I would need to rely on more than just hope and enthusiasm. You will too. No matter what you do, you will need your family, your friends, and your faith, no matter how you define those things. If any of those things are askew, work at making them right, please. On that note, I would like to talk to you today about two things that have defined my life, failure and friendship. First, a disclaimer. I realize that on the ladder of definitions of the word struggle, that the struggle of the actor is on the bottom rung. Unlike very real struggles that are put upon people because of their race, their color, or their creed, the struggle of the creative person is a struggle in which I invited myself to partake after being considerably warned by many people of the difficulties I might encounter, I still pursued it. Armed with my St. Jude necklace, I went to New York. I studied at an acting program for two years. I worked as a typewriter salesman back when there still were typewriters. I toiled writing plays, auditioning, doing commercials, trying to get jobs, hosting kids game shows, being the Rick. All the while pining for my chance at a title shot, my own primetime series that I created where I could prove to people that there was more to me than had yet met their eyes. Eleven years later, I got it. The show was called The Mike O'Malley Show. I spent an incredible amount of time on the title. All through the summer of 1999, it was promoted like it was going to be the next link in NBC's hit sitcom legacy. My name and face were everywhere. In September of that year, it premiered to horrible reviews, worse ratings, and was canceled after two episodes. The velocity with which this occurred was devastating to me. The muscularity that went into the criticism mind-altering. I learned the hard way that if you offer yourself up for people to have an opinion of you, they will have an opinion. If you make yourself so noticeable that people are asked their opinion of you, they will respond in the manner in which they see fit. I was schooled in the ways of the printed word with swift and lasting effects. I learned that freedom of speech doesn't guarantee kindness or encourage it. I had thought that if I opened myself up and shared my passions with everyone, that there would be a reciprocity and appreciation from everyone. But you know what? I found out that that is a rah-rah theater company mindset that doesn't apply in a business where ad rates determine who wins. And this time it wasn't going to be me. The cancellation was front page news on New Hampshire's biggest newspaper, The Union Leader. Front page Middle of the paper, local boy makes bad. It was a fall in your face, flat out bomb of a show that I spent a decade working towards. And there I was at 32, thinking I was out of the business. I had put all my chips on the table and failed. I was crushed, I was ashamed, I was bitter. I wanted to leave the country. Forget who I was, 
give up. Today, I still can't help but wonder how things would have gone had I named it American Idol. I stand here on the other side of that debacle for one reason, my friends. I include my family in that category, I've made my family my friends, and I tell you that my devotion to my friendships and the devotion that they in turn have shown me is the only reason I was able to continue. My friends circled the wagons, they flew into town to lift my spirits, they sent me messages of hope that reminded me of their love, and their loyalty gave me perspective as I was swirling. I had, since the day I left UNH, made it my mission to tend to my friendships. And to say that it paid off is to turn something sacred into a commodity. But you know what? It paid off. With the help of Lisa and my friends, Lisa's my wife, and St. Jude, who still hung around my neck, I dusted myself off, and five months later, I got cast in Yes, Dear. Thank you. We made six seasons of the show and shot 122 episodes. I appreciated every second of it. Since yesterday has begun, my wife and I have been blessed with two children, Fiona and Seamus. Every inch of our house is safety proof for them. Edges of tables have pads to prevent injury. Sockets have been plugged with plastic to prevent electrocution. Staircases gated, cabinets locked, furniture braced. Food cut into unchokable sizes. And still my children, they stumble, they fall, they scrape their faces and their knees. They throw items not created for throwing at one another. They pick up small stones not meant for swallowing and they stick them in their mouth faster than the flash. It is a miracle anyone makes it past the age of two. When you look at your parents and you see the lines in their faces and the gray in their hair, what you are seeing is their love for you. Thank them today. Whether you understand them or not, whether they get you or don't, whether they put you through school or didn't, they got you past the age of two. And that alone is worth their gratitude. Or your gratitude, I guess. They love you, I'm sure, like I love my children. And their excitement about your achievement today comes with, no doubt, their concerns for your continued well-being. I love my kids so much, I wish I could give them what a friend of mine calls a helmet for life. An indestructible, wearable item that will protect them from the pain they will experience, not from life, but from people. For the pain they will inflict on other people, for the pains they will absorb, for the mean things they... People will say to them, and the mean things they will say to others. I wish for them a life helmet, and I wish the same for you, but I don't know how to make one. So since I cannot outfit you with a life helmet, I will, in a time-honored tradition, pass along some advice you will forget by tonight's first cold beverage. I'm sure you'll be able to read this online when you have the time. These are some lessons I've learned from the many blunders I've made in my own life. First off, if you really mess something up, begin referring to it as a blunder. It will immediately lower your self-loathing quotient. Find a way to minimize cruelty. I'm not telling you what kind of cruelty to rally against because cruelty manifests itself in many ways. You may not think you can make an impact. You can. If the only initial gesture you can make is to refrain from this day forward from muttering unkind remarks about others, you're already ahead of the majority of us. In all matters of the heart, try, try, try to be kind. Relationships are mysterious, they're joyous, they're difficult. But if you carelessly mess them up, you will cause yourself more pain than necessary. Try not to dent them deliberately. Be careful with one another. Life will serve you up with enough brand name concerns. Please don't try to create your own from scratch. Before uttering the phrase, I'm following my heart, watch a medical show where they perform open heart surgery. You know how much effort it takes to, and the amount of things that have to happen before they even get into the heart? 
They have to put you under, they gotta numb you up, they gotta slice your skin, they peel it back, they cut through tissue and muscle, then they take out a saw and hack through your ribs. This is what it takes to get into the heart. It should take at least as much effort to discover what you think you're following and what you think you're feeling before you follow it. Do not let life pass you by without learning how to give a good toast or acknowledge a great shared moment. Mark occasions. Try as often as you can to give tribute to your friends, to stay in contact, to be at their momentous occasions. Drive across the country and go into debt to be at their weddings. Fly across the country and be with them when their parents pass away. One thing you realize when you get to be 39 is that you cannot make any new old friends. Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, there is nothing to fear but fear itself. He obviously didn't get out very much. There's plenty to fear. The world, as you know, it can be a sinister place. You hold in your pockets devices that can bring you up to the second bad news from around the world. It is the kind of bad news that can stagger the stoutest among us. So how do you have hope when such despair constantly hovers? I don't really know. Other than this, be a good person. It would be trite advice if it weren't so difficult to do. Be a good person. Be a good person. Be a good person. You know what this means. And if you don't run it by your conscience, it will seldom, if ever, lie. Be a good person. Be a good person. It is so, 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 so difficult to do all the time. Try as much as you can in all of your endeavors to be one of the greatest human beings you've ever met because I'm telling you, you have it in you to be that shirt off your back kind of person. If you want an example, go to Nashua and look at my mother. She's an inspiration. And her example has been my cross to bear. All that goodness in one person, it's downright maddening. My father's no slouch in that department either. Ask yourself what you can do to add to the sum total of goodness and then do it. The Roman Emperor, Marcus Aurelius, wrote in his meditations, to what then must we aspire? This and this alone, the just thought, the unselfish action, the tongue that utters no falsehood. Of course, after he meditated on this, he probably fed his pet lions a couple of Christians, so do with that what you will. Here's, here's the good news. College was not the best four years of your life. They were the best four years of your life so far. In the days and years ahead, there will be people you will fall in love with, great friends you have yet to meet, children you will have that will bring you immeasurable joy, and goals that, will, that you will set that will give you and provide you with purpose. You will stand on your own two feet, and together with your friends, you will try to fix what is wrong with the world, and you will. I believe it. You will move the ball further down the field in the direction of goodness. You have living to do, friends to keep, problems to solve, and blunders to turn into advice. And if you ever find yourself questioning your journey, I want you to think of me. I want you to think of me in the summer of 2004 when I was in Canada. I was there shooting a movie called The Perfect Man with Hilary Duff and Heather Locklear. I was playing Lenny, a man who was vying for the affections of Heather Locklear. For those of you who don't know who Heather Locklear is, 18 years ago when I sat at this ceremony, she was already a success. So I was thrilled to be playing her boyfriend. And at the end of one scene on a wet street, one Toronto summer night, Heather Locklear and I kissed. Hey, don't get excited, it was scripted, so I don't... It was scripted, but that's neither here nor there. You know what? We, we kissed. So if over the next 18 years and after, if you find yourself down on your luck, I want you to remember that there's plenty of time to turn things around, that there are people on your side, and that the great part of life is the people who are in it with you. 
helping you find meaning in it. And if there's really something you really want to do with your life, and you're at a crossroads where you're questioning whether or not you are able to continue, just remember, if a former kids game show host who grew up in Nashua got cut from the varsity baseball team, left college with a 2.89 GPA, and starred in one of the quickest canceled shows in sitcom history, could find himself on a quiet night in Canada kissing Heather Locklear, you too can make your dreams come true. Best of luck. Thank you. Edward O'Malley, recipient of the honorary degree. Michael Edward O'Malley, your talent for capturing the 